I wanted to welcome everyone to uh, today's event on holistic cancer care. Um, really excited because, you know, Dr. Abrams is such a, a leader in this space. Uh, we will be talking about nutrition, um, natural supplements, including cannabis, and also talk about exercise, physical activity, and mind, body, uh, and spirit practices. So with acupuncture, yoga, meditation. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Donald Abrams, again, a leading integrative uh, oncologist. Um, he's at the Osher Center at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF. Professor Emeritus of Medicine at UCSF and was also a past chief of hematology oncology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Um, we will be talking not about alternative medicine, we're talking about integrative, so that's a mix of conventional and complementary therapies. And we will be incorporating, we had a lot of pre-submitted questions. We'll try to take on as much as possible um, also during the event, but keep in mind, we have limited time. And Dr. Abrams is not doing consults for individual cases. This is about um, you know, the broader topics at hand and again, not medical advice. So I'm going to uh, bring, uh, bring Dr. Abrams back in. Dr. Abrams, welcome and thank you for, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I know you have so many areas of expertise. Um, you know, you were a pioneer with, with cannabis, back with HIV AIDS. Uh, you've, you know, studied traditional Chinese medicine, medicinal mushrooms. I've read that your biggest passion in this space is nutrition and cancer, and that's what we will be starting with. So I, you know, I met you, Dr. Abrams, when I was undergoing my own treatment at UCSF, uh, going through lots of chemotherapy. And I was asking you, I said, I got diagnosed as soon as people heard, they were like, eat this, not that, do keto. We get bombarded with so much information. So let's start with that. What is your general guidance to people when you're talking about nutrition and diet with cancer? Yeah, great. Good question. Yeah, I am not a believer in any of the so-called name diets, vegan, ketogenic, paleo, uh, all of those. Uh, I believe the diet should be organic, plant-based antioxidant rich, anti-inflammatory whole foods. And going back to front, I say whole foods, not to support Jeff Bezos, uh, who doesn't need my support, but because I see a lot of patients who say, I have cancer, I'm gonna juice everything. Or I have cancer, I'm gonna sprinkle broccoli powder in a smoothie. I think it's always better to eat whole foods. Inflammation we now believe is one of the major causes of degenerative diseases of aging, dementia, heart disease, and cancer. And there's much that we can do by what we eat and what we don't eat to impact inflammation. Oxygen is two molecules linked together. That's how we breathe, that's how we live. But when those oxygen molecules separate, they create so-called free radicals or reactive oxygen species, which knock into our DNA, causing damage leading to aging or cancer. Antioxidants take those free radicals out of circulation so they don't do damage. Turns out most foods that are rich in antioxidants are plants. Animal products are not a good source of antioxidants. That's why I say the diet should be plant-based. I don't think you need to be vegetarian or vegan or raw, but you should have at least five to nine servings or three and a half to four cups of fruits and vegetables each day, more vegetables than fruits. And then as much as possible, they should all be organic. And that's not just to avoid herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, which are chemicals that we don't need in our body, it's because a plant that's grown outdoors organically needs to fight to protect itself from other plants, birds and insects, and the sunshine. And the only way a plant knows how to protect itself is by making chemicals. It turns out those chemicals that the plant makes are the ones that benefit us. So if we're gonna let food be our medicine and medicine be our food, organic is more potent than conventional. That's such great information. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abrams. We did get uh, a live Q&A already, and I just want to ask, you know, you, uh, Jessica asks, you mentioned degenerative diseases of aging. What about early age onset cancer? Uh, well, I, I'm saying inflammation is responsible for many degenerative diseases of aging, probably not for early onset cancers, but still important to decrease inflammation. And to be honed down a little bit, the the foods that I like best are the cruciferous vegetables. Flowers grow in the shape of a crucifix. So broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts jump to mind, but there are also cruciferous roots and green leafies, cabbage, kale, collard green, bok choy, and arugula. These all contain a chemical so potent at reducing the risk of cancer that we started to look at it as chemotherapy. 
orange yellow vegetables are good. Uh, carrots, uh, sweet potatoes, squash, uh, heavily pigmented fruits. The berries are all very good for you. Blueberry, blackberry, raspberry. They really should be organic because they're like sponges for toxins. Uh, I like ginger, garlic, onions, and turmeric uh, for seasoning, as well as the Mediterranean spices, basil, thyme, rosemary, and oregano. For animal products, I like deep cold water fish, salmon, black cod, albacore tuna, herring, mackerel, and sardines, and uh, organic poultry. Eggs are not as good a food as people make them out to be. We have a strong egg lobby. I'm also not so fond of dairy. Uh, guidelines that I use are the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund, and their guidelines for reducing the risk of cancer. But number 10 says for cancer survivors, follow the nine guidelines above. And their guideline on meat is limit consumption of red and processed meats. It used to say in 2007, limit consumption of red meat and avoid processed meat, which I think is a better guideline because processed meats, bacon, salami, bologna, hot dog, sausage, anything you put on a pizza are considered a class one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. But the number one no is sugar, refined sugar. Sugar attached to fruit is fine, but sugar that's refined or added to so many foods nowadays is not good for us at all. You know, there's just so much to cover, I know, in such a limited amount of time. Um, I do want to dive into this dairy topic. I remember I, I, I mentioned to you, I was like, oh, there's lactose intolerant. You were like, most people are yeah. <laughs> lactose intolerant. Can you, can you talk about this? Yeah, so... Uh, dairy, there's no other animal that drinks another species milk, but no other animal drives a car or goes to college either. So that's not a very good argument, but no animal drinks milk after they've been weaned. And by the age of three or four, we actually lose the ability to digest the sugars and the proteins in dairy. We make a big deal about fat, low fat, no fat, 2%. It's not the fat. If you want a dairy product, butter is probably best because it's mainly fat. We talk about lactose intolerance as if it's a disease or a disorder when in fact it's the norm. And the ability to digest lactose is actually a genetic mutation on the second chromosome found mainly in Scandinavians who needed to digest reindeer milk in times of freeze. The rest of us, particularly Asians, are all lactose intolerant and we don't know until we stop. So people always then say, well, what about yogurt? So yogurt, or kefir, the sugars and the proteins have been altered by the bacteria. So if you need a dairy product, butter, because it's mainly fat, or yogurt or kefir, as long as they're not artificially flavored, artificially colored, or with added sugar. People then always also ask, what about cheese? Well, yeah, cheese is dairy. But many of my patients uh, ask me to watch the movie, What the Health? which is a militant vegan uh, conspiracy theorist movie that suggests that modern medicine is withholding information about nutrition from the world because we wanna to continue to treat diabetes, uh, heart disease, and cancer. But the one thing I learned in that movie is that when we try to digest the casein, the protein in cheese, it becomes a casomorph, which complexes with the opiate receptor in the brain. So people actually do become addicted to cheese. And that's why that's a hard one for people to stop. For example, the ketogenic diet, which is basically 70% fat and 30% protein and no carbohydrates is probably the, the least in consistent with the recommendations from the Institute of Medicine on what constitutes a healthy diet. I hear patients tell me all the time, I cut out carbs. Carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables are carbohydrates fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all the things that we're supposed to eat. I think what they're saying is they cut out simple carbohydrates, white bread, white pasta, white rice. That's probably a good idea because those things become sugar very quickly in the bloodstream. So, uh, you know, the, that, that ketogenic diet, which is, you know, was developed in the 1920s as a treatment for epilepsy in children, uh, because we didn't have any anti-seizure medicines at the time, you know, why would somebody with cancer think an anti-epilepsy diet would be healthy for them? I think what ketogenesis does is it decreases uh, insulin and insulin-like growth factor, 
both of which promote inflammation and cause cancer cells to grow. And I say the best way to do that is to eliminate sugar. I mean, the number one guideline is uh, be a healthy weight. Number two is to be physically active. Uh, and number three is the first that says anything about food. And it was unveiled in 2007 as a new guideline. And it said, avoid sugary drinks. So I went to the microphone in Bethesda because I was at the conference and I said, there are sugary drinks and there are sugary drinks. You can drink a, a cola beverage, hopefully not, or a fruit punch, which is probably glucose and high fructose corn syrup, where you can squeeze three oranges in the morning. And the response from the podium was energetically, they're all the same. Because if you eat an orange, the fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. But if you squeeze the sugar away from the fiber, it's like drinking a carbonated cola beverage. So in Australia, in fact, they've, they rate foods in the supermarket for consumers and they've dropped orange juice from five stars to two stars. So why is that bad when the body sees all that sugar? Again, it responds with insulin and insulin-like growth factor, both of which promote inflammation and the growth factor is a growth factor for cancer cells as well. So that's why sugar is the number one no. And I think patients with lymphoma are very aware of what a PET CT scan is. And what they inject you with in a PET CT scan is radio labeled sugar. And where does it go? <sighs> to the active cancer. So we've taken advantage of the fact that cancer loves sugar uh, to figure out where it is and how to stage it. Yes, very familiar with that PET CT scan and the contrast <laughs> that goes through our bodies. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have an audience question from Lisa N, who's a patient who says there's much conflicting information about foods for estrogen positive breast cancer and also cannabis. So this also helps segue us into, into the next um, segment. Can you clarify this at all? Yeah, I think the confusion probably is mainly around soy. Uh, soy is actually good for us. Uh, the reason that Asians living in Asia eating an Asian diet, which is rich in soy, have lower rates of both breast and prostate cancer is because soy, especially during adolescence, uh, modulates uh, uh, hormones and you know, will decrease the risk of those cancers. Because soy is a plant estrogen or a phytoestrogen, women, particularly with estrogen receptor positive cancers, either breast, ovarian, or uterine cancer, are concerned and fearful that soy might make their cancer worse. In fact, large studies, including one done by Kaiser here in Northern California, have demonstrated that women who eat a whole soy food daily, soybean, soy milk, tofu, tempeh, or miso, have a decreased risk of recurrence of their breast cancer. So, you know, that is a very frequent question that I have. And I often surprise people by reviewing that data with them. There was also a large study in Shanghai, uh, which uh, revealed the same, that soy is actually good for women with breast cancer. The issue is really that no plant estrogen can compete with a woman's own estrogen as far as potency. And so somehow the soy probably blocks the effect of a woman's estrogen in driving estrogen receptor positive cancers. Good question. I love that you're pointing out too, this is about different populations and different populations with different diets. Um, and unless, I mean, I think there's just such a breadth of information. It's like, unless we study it, it's so hard sometimes to, you know, tell what applies to us individually as patients. So this is where your voice matters so much. 